Yeah. Great. Right. Okay. Uh, our, our next speaker is Robert Rausendorf, who will tell us about uh, contextuality, Wigner negativity, and rebits. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aaron. So this is joint work with uh, Nicolas Delfos, who is a postdoc uh, in Sherbrooke, and with Philippe Allard Guerin and Jake Vian, who are students with me uh, at UBC. So let me start out with a similar sounding question uh, to what uh, Dave Wineland asked. So what makes quantum computing work? So here we are not after explaining a physical device, but what is the crucial quantum property that powers quantum computing? And I think uh, in regards to this question, it's fair to say that we do not know. There's all sorts of opinions about it, and here are some of them. Uh, I do not want to talk about all of them. In fact, I in my talk today, I'll just focus on one, and uh, this is contextuality. So I want to make I, I want to lend additional <coughs> credibility to this position that contextuality is a relevant resource for quantum computing. So here is our result. So we are working with a particular model of quantum computation, this so-called uh, computation by injection of magic states. And our result is that with respect to this model, contextuality uh, is a necessary resource for your universality uh, if we run this uh, scheme of quantum computation on rebits. So the, the rebit part uh, is, the, is the new part uh, of this result. And there is something good about it and something bad about it. So the good part is the bit part. So we are able to address two level systems. That was previously not possible. And the bad part about it is the re part. I mean, we would want to talk about qubits, but we are forced to talk about rebits. We, we, we don't know how to do better. So there is still a gap. So uh, what's making this analysis fun is these little monsters over here. So these are Merman's square and Merman's star, and they are cousins. So these are state-independent proofs of contextuality. Very beautiful things, uh, but with respect to our goal, establishing contextuality as a resource, they look like set to spoil the party. And uh, what I want to do in my talk uh, is to explain that they don't, that they are in, far in, in fact uh, part of the party. They have a role to play, and that will hopefully be the, the fun part of my talk. So let's see how this is embedded in things that you find in the literature. So contextuality in relation to uh, quantum computation has been discussed for quite some time now, and it starts perhaps with uh, a, a paper by Di Vincenzo in Paris, and they identified uh, contextuality as a resource that's present in quantum code words. So quantum codes are not quantum computation. I mean, that could just be used for memory. But so we can say that contextuality was seen in the outskirts of quantum computation. Then more in the center, there is a result published in 2009 by Janet Anders and uh, Dan Brown that showed that contextuality is a necessary resource in measurement-based quantum computation. And just last year, uh, the uh, Emerson Group, Mark Howard and company, they sh showed a similar result uh, for the circuit model uh, with state injection. So contextuality uh, is also a necessary resource for quantum computation with magic states. Uh, and I will be working in that very framework today. So what they showed, uh, so, so their result is limited to a situations where your local system uh, has, uh, the Hilbert space of your local system has an odd prime dimension. And as I said earlier, I'll talk about the two-dimensional case uh, where we have to deal with state-independent contextuality. Okay, so here's an outline of my talk. Uh, so my talk will have a review part. I need to explain a few things. I want to explain contextuality. I want to explain Wigner functions. I want to explain very briefly uh, quantum computation by state injection in case uh, you don't know about it. And then uh, there is uh, this other part which, which is about our results. 
Okay, so let's begin. Let's talk about uh, uh, hidden variable models and contextuality. I want to define contextuality as the opposite of non-contextuality, and so I'll begin with hidden variable models. So in quantum mechanics, we're used to describing physical systems by quantum states. In a hidden variable model, this, this is a competing description of the physical world. We have just a something, and it has some a catalog attached to it. And the catalog says, when observable A is measured upon me, then I output the outcome lambda A. If B is measured upon me, I output lambda B, and so on and so forth. And then furthermore, to mimic uh, the randomness of quantum measurement, you can think of uh, a probability distribution of these catalogs. And the question is, does, does this model uh, give you the can give you the same prediction as quantum mechanics? And the answer to this is in general yes, but that changes if you make the seemingly most innocuous additional assumption, which is the assumption of non-contextuality. So let me explain that. So assume we have three observables that we might want to measure, A, B, and C, such that A commutes with both B and C. So we can measure A and B jointly and A and C jointly. So non-contextuality is the requirement that the value that appears here in this catalog for the observable A is independent on whether I measure A jointly with B or jointly with C. And that sounds very reasonable, a requirement, because I could delay the choice uh, of whether I will measure B or C after the measurement of A. So it seems reasonable, but it is an assumption. And if I make this additional assumption, then suddenly hidden variable models fall apart. They can no longer describe uh, quantum mechanics. They don't, do not give the same predictions anymore, and this is the content of the quotient specker theorem, and it holds in dimension three and higher. So much about that. Here now, the computational scheme, quantum computation by state injection. So this is intended for universal quantum computation, but we do not allow ourselves a universal gate sets. We have to get by with a restricted gate set, and to make up for it, we have these magic states, which are states that cannot be created with the restricted gates. Uh, okay, and this can be made to work. You can build universal quantum computer out of that. And if this looks odd to you, there is a practical motivation for it. If you're interested in fault tolerance, the schemes that give you the best thresholds and the best overhead scaling are exactly of that form. Okay, so we are, for the purpose of this talk, not interested in potential practicalities. Uh, our motivation for considering this model uh, is a different one. Namely, we observe here that computational power is transferred from gates to states. And now we are asking, what is the critical property of that makes this computation work? It's now a question about states rather than processes, and maybe that's an easier question. So let's just ask it. Which properties must these magic states possess to enable universality? And two answers to this question have been given in, in the work that came out from the Emerson group. Uh, they have to have Wigner function negativity, and they have to have contextuality. Contextuality I just explained to some extent. Let me briefly talk, <coughs> hopefully for the benefit of computer scientists, uh, about Wigner functions. So let's begin classical mechanics. So a useful thing uh, to consider in classical mechanics is this probability distribution over phase space. So phase space is spanned by position and momentum coordinates, and then I can have a probability distribution uh, over that space. So consider, consider a stone flying through air. Uh, it always has a position or momentum coordinate, and they can be very well defined, and this would correspond to a peaked distribution of, over phase space. And I'm um, now, what, should I not explain this? You think it's too elementary? Okay, <laughs> but I, I'm not. I'm not going to throw this at anyone. So um, yeah. So the question is, can we have something similar in quantum mechanics? And the new feature in quantum mechanics is, of course, that position and momentum no longer commute; they cannot uh, be measured simultaneously. So what would we want to require of a quantum counterpart of this joint probability distribution? 
So what we want to require, whatever this thing is, the marginals have to come out right. So if I just kind of integrate over, say, the momentum direction, I'll get a probability distribution. And that has to give me the correct prediction of what I would want what I would measure, what I would obtain if I measured position and likewise for momentum. The marginals have to come out right. This is what I want to impose on this thing and I can construct such a function. It's called the Wigner function. But the Wigner function, and here is where quantum mechanics comes in, is not a probability distribution. It is only what's called a quasi-probability distribution. It can go negative. And because that doesn't happen in the classical case, this negativity is taken as an indication of quantumness. So then, let's, say, let's ask, so which states have this property of negativity in their Wigner function and which don't? So there is an easy characterization uh, of the states that don't have negativity in their Wigner function if we confine our attention to pure states. And the only states with positive Wigner function, only pure states with positive Wigner function, are the Gaussian states. That's the content of the Hudson's theorem, and if you wonder where I'm going with this, Hudson's theorem will be key when we connect this um, to our computational model uh, in a moment. So, of course, our computational model is about finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, so we need to adjust or adapt Wigner functions to finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. This can be done, uh, no problem with that. It's the only thing I want to point out here. So if our Hilbert space dimension is D, then the Wigner function will live on a d by d grid. So that's all I want to point out here. Okay, so we can ask the question again for this modified Wigner function. Uh, what are the states with positive Wigner function? And here is the connection with our computational model. The state, the pure states with positive Wigner function are exactly the stabilizer states, which is exactly the states that are cheap in our computational model. So stabilizer states are now classical from two perspectives. They are classical because their Wigner functions are negative and they are classical because they are for free in our computational model with, uh, uh, with the injection of magic states. So the, the stabilizer states are the non-magic states. And it's because of Hudson's theorem essentially that Wigner functions are of interest for this computational model. So let me just end my summary here uh, just by displaying uh, the final results that have come out of, of, of Emerson's group. So, so far I have pretty much explained that Clifford operations cannot introduce negativity into the Wigner function. So whatever Wigner function is ever going to be there in the course of computation must come from the initial magic state states. And that makes Wigner negativity a resource. What I didn't explain uh, but it's true that in this model, contextuality and Wigner negativity are exactly the same thing. Thank you. And, and, and by this uh, uh, result, also Wigner negativity uh, is a resource. So now I want to move on uh, to, to the results part of this talk. So we are now considering a local Hilbert space dimension two. Let me first spell out what the problems are. Be problem begins with the Wigner function. So here uh, is the expression of the Wigner function for the infinite dimensional case. You do not need to part uh, all of this. Just note that division by two comes in here. So we can adjust this to finite dimensional state spaces provided two has an inverse in the field FD. And if D, our dimension is two, that's not gonna happen. So we need a different notion of the Wigner function. Here comes the more serious problem. Here is where Merman's square enters. So what you see here uh, is the graphical representation of a state-independent proof of contextuality. So the game would be you have a bunch of Pauli operators here with eigenvalues plus minus one, and you want to assign outcomes, classical predetermined outcomes to them. So you cannot do this completely freely. So every horizontal and vertical line here is a context, meaning that all these observables pairwise commute. And also they multiply to plus minus the identity, and this implies a constraint uh, on the values the, uh, uh, that you assign. So if the product here of these observables is plus the identity, the values have to multiply to plus one. And 
likewise for minus the identity. So it's easy to convince yourself that you cannot find an assignment, meaning there is no non-contextual hidden variable model that describes these measurements, measurements of these observables, and that's completely state independent. Okay, so now this seems to ruin uh, our resource perspective in the following ways. Number one, so clearly, if we are allowed to measure all these observables, then uh, contextuality is present uh, in the measurements, which we regard as trivial gates. We wanted to attribute all the resources to the initial magic state. So this is a cosmetic flaw, I would say, that makes the whole setting unnatural, but it's a lot worse than that. Furthermore, you can convert this graphic here, this proof, uh, into a contextuality witness. A contextuality witness is just some linear operator uh, of which you can take expectation values with respect to states. And if the expectation value is in a certain range, means you are contextual. And if you do this with this Merman square here, if you convert it into a witness, each and every two qubit state uh, comes out contextual, even if the com even the completely mixed density matrix. Meaning, contextuality is generic, but then how can it be a resource? So these are the problems we have to deal with. Here's the changes we make. Change number one, uh, we move to rebits. So our density matrix will be real with respect to the computational basis at all times. And, like, and in addition to that, um, we restrict the restricted gate set even more. It's no longer the, the Clifford gates, but it's going to be only uh, the CSSness preserving Clifford gates. So note that these changes do not give a remedy immediately. The Hilbert space, local Hilbert space dimension is still two, and our Mervyn square is still embedded in real quantum mechanics. We have not gotten rid of it yet. Okay. So these are the tasks. Have you shown me the 10 minute mark yet? <laughs> Good, all right, I, I, need, I need to speak faster. Uh, so here are the tasks. We have to devise a computational scheme that addresses this new scenario. We have to construct a matching Wigner function and matching no notion of state dependent contextuality and then establish it as a resource. I'm not gonna say much about the first part here. So there's a bunch of circuits to construct uh, it's a manageable task. I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, I just want to say two things. So you may say, how can this ever be universal if everything is just real quantum mechanics, not complex quantum mechanics? So it turns out, by an encoding of uh, uh, Rudolph and Grover, you can embed n qubits in n plus one rebits. So that's not a problem. And the other thing that I want to mention here is, as I already said, we are restricting to gates that the, the, the cheap gates that even further to the CSS is preserving Clifford gates, and that has to come with a change in the state preparations we allow and the measurements we allow. So the state preparations can only produce CSS states to be <laughs> cheap, and the measurements must preserve CSS of states, and that. Uh, restricts your measurements to those two. So you are no longer allowed to measure all Pauli operators, but only those Pauli operators that are entirely tensor products of sigma x or entirely tensor products of sigma z. And that's going to be important. That's why I have highlighted here in color. So that's all I'm going to say about the computational scheme. So let's talk about the Wigner function, how we define it. So what you see here is the phase space for two rebits. It's a four by four grid. And so what we want to do is we want to assign a number to each point in phase space. And that should be linear in the density matrix. So we are dealing with an expression of this form. So all that remains is we have to specify these operators A, V, so-called phase point operators. There's one for each point in phase space. So let's begin with what this operator looks like at the origin of phase space, A0. So yeah, so we define these Pauli operators, these translation operators in this fashion, and A0 will just be the equal weighted superposition of all those operators here that are real. So this condition down here 
and forces that we only pick the real ones and we just uh, add them up. So that's the phase point operator over here. And the other ones are just obtained by conjugation with the corresponding translation operator up here. So that's what they are. And I don't have the time to show you in detail, but here are important properties of this Wigner function. Um, so first, it is informationally complete. I can recover the density matrix from it. And furthermore, we have this important property. We, we want to compute the trace of a product of two operators. It is a product of the corresponding Wigner function. So this is important, say, if you want to uh, evaluate expectation values in the Wigner function formalism. So this property is going to be important for us in a moment. The property down here is nice, but not important, so I'm not talking about it. So uh, let's get back to a Hudson's theorem. So what's the Hudson theorem going to look out here in our case? The Hudson's theorem singles this time singles out not the real stabilizer states as the states with positive Wigner function. It singles out the CSS states only. And this is the justification for the restriction in the gate set that we made. We want the cheap gates to be the gates that preserve this set of states. Hence, CSS is preserving uh, gates. Okay, so this is pretty much what I wanted to say about Wigner function and its negativity. Uh, I want to move to contextuality. And here's the link between Wigner function negativity and contextuality. Non-negativity implies non-contextuality. Non Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, and why is that? So here's a proof sketch. Um, a non-negative Wigner function gives us a non-contextual hidden variable model, and you see it right here from this expression. So this is, use, this is using the formula from two slides back. So if I suppose I'm doing some measurement of with P of VM elements E subscript A, where little a is the measurement outcome, then the probability for getting an outcome is just by the Born rule given by this expression here. And in terms of Wigner functions, it looks like this. So if the Wigner function of my state is non-negative, I can regard it as a probability. And I would regard this uh, as a conditional probability for getting outcome little a given the internal state u. So that's precisely what a hidden variable model is. So that's it, except we've been shuffling something under the rock, and this is the last thing uh, that I'm going to explain here in this talk. Uh, so if we are looking at the Wigner functions of the effects, they, they, they look something like this. So that these are zero, one functions. So in terms of conditional probabilities, they are either zero or one. So what this means is that for all the observables we consider, real Pauli observables, each starting from some internal state of a hidden variable model, they, they get assigned values plus minus one for each of these observables. But wait a minute, can this really be true? How does this fit with Merman square? Which is Merman square told us no such consistent assignment exists. So let's just try that, and it's maybe the last thing I point out. Uh, let's just uh, sp specialize to one point in phase space, uh, namely the origin. So that would lead to an assignment of the value plus one for all these observables. So let's see if this is consistent. Well, it works out in most contexts. doesn't work out down here. So is there a problem? Seems like, but there is not, because in our setting, we cannot measure in this context, even if we can measure in this context in real quantum mechanics. And the reason is our CSS restriction. The only observables we can measure are either tensor products of sigma x or sigma z. So we can still measure this guy individually by measuring these two uh, compatible observables and multiplying the outcomes. Likewise, we can still measure this guy individually in a single shot measurement but not those two combined, because that would require these physical measurements and they are not commuting. So this is the res resolution to the Merman square paradox and a similar resolution exists for all the state independent proofs. So there is no problem with that. And I think I've pretty much used up my time. So let me just go through the rest of this quickly. 
Okay? Negativity does not imply contextuality. Uh, so there are different notions. One implies the other, but not the other way around. So continuing with Merman Square, we can now construct uh, entanglement, excuse me, contextuality witnesses based on it. They just detect contextuality in states. And well, we have a large class of them. So n namely, whenever a witness like this, which is just derived from the Merman Square, gives a negative value, we know that there's no hidden variable model description for it. Yeah, and in this way, we can show that our cheap gates never introduce contextuality in the setting. Whatever is there in terms of contextuality must have come from the initial state. <coughs> Hence, contextuality is a resource. So that's all. Um, yeah, contextuality is a resource, and state-independent contextuality is not a problem, even if initially it seemed like. Thank you very much. Questions? Over here. Uh, <laughs> so you mentioned that uh, contextuality is necessary for uh, measurement-based quantum computation. Uh, so it's also shown that uh, you can have measurement-based quantum computation with continuous variable uh, uh, cluster states, but their Wigner functions are positive. So, uh, so in that case, how would you identify contextuality? Um, so, let's see. So, the, uh, so the the result actually uh, of contextuality in measurement-based quantum computation has been established for qubits only. So, I do not. Uh, okay, so someone wants to answer this question. Well, I cannot say anything about the, uh, the infinite dimensional case. Somebody is waving to answer the question, so I just hand it over to the audience. Um, yeah, so it has been established for infinite squeezing. Uh, in the uh, error-free computation has been established for infinite squeezing. So those states are unphysical. Fault-tolerant quantum computation has been established for finite squeezing, but the trick is that you need POVMs. Equivalently, you need to inject some sort of uh, non-contextuality into the state by the type of information that you're processing and the, the way that you do error correction. So it, what he said was th the equivalent of this would be that homodyne detections are non-contextual on Gaussian states. Positive Wigner function. Yeah, that's right. So we have to do more than homodyne detection. That's the point. More questions over here. Oh yeah. uh, I, I was just wondering if uh, this uh, Wigner function that you define has anything to do with the Weyl Heisenberg group. Uh, because one way to define a discrete Wigner function is to pick a particular irreducible representation of the Weyl Heisenberg group and take trace of that times rho. Does this have anything to do with, with that? Well, I, uh, I mean, in the in continuous case, for example, in infinite case, the displacement operators are also, um, you know, satisfy this property. Okay, so, um, uh, is that stop working? Okay, so what I can say is, uh, if, you, if you look at our definition of the, of the Wigner function, if you look at our definition of the Wigner function, so for um, the odd prime dimensional case, it coincides uh, basically with the definition I have given here for uh, infinite dimensional state spaces. So if you take this, so this, th if you take this definition to odd prime finite dimensional state spaces, um, so my Wigner function uh, uh, coincides with that. So except here, uh, w yeah. So for qubit, qubits, it would look exactly like that, except you wouldn't have this restriction. So and we are having it because we want this thing to be real. So I mean, the important structure uh, I is all there. I mean, we have here the the translation operator. So this this I mean, this is very similar uh, to, to the other cases of odd prime dimension, but it's not exactly the same thing. One last question from Charlie Bennett. Um, you had a nice uh, slogan, a, a 
contextuality implies uh, Wigner negativity, but not the reverse. Mm -hmm. But I got confused as to in which setting this is. This is in, in, in general or for this uh, uh, qubit setting with the uh, rebit setting with the CSS restriction and so on. Yes, this, this uh, well, <coughs> this applies to the rebit setting, specifically with the Wigner function we have defined here. So you may be asking because of Rob Speckin's work, uh, because there is a paper out there saying Wigner negativity and contextuality are one and the same thing. And Rob Speckin's setting differs in a number of ways. Uh, most importantly, here we are di discussing just a single Wigner function. He discusses many. And also here we are keeping, for the hidden variable models, we are keeping what's that called value determinedness. So every observable, for every internal state of the hidden variable model, every uh, observable has to be assigned a definite value. And Rob Speckens is abolishing this criterion. What he says is given an internal state, of the hidden variable model, all we need to have is probability distributions for outcomes. So, and, and, and these are the differences. The uh, the usual continuous Wigner function. Um, well, it wouldn't have uh, this contextuality that we're observing here at all. So there wouldn't be a counterpart to to Merman square for that setting. Okay, so let's let's uh, thank Robert again. <laughs>